that when you're doing web development, there's a mix of the design and there's a mix of the technical aspect. And the technical aspect is like what tags you, you know, how do you make a tag? How do you make a link? How do you make a table? And so on. And that's very important, right? If you can't do that, then, you know, nothing's going to get done. But just as important is the design aspect of it. How, what you can do to make your page more usable. All right? And you need all those things for the page to be successful. I've seen so many sites that were technically competent, but were very unworkable. All right? Um, one thing that we're going to talk about this uh, as we go over this, and again, I'm, I'm just going to set these thoughts out now and we'll keep coming back and repeating them. But the notion of simplicity, all right? If you think about websites that you like and websites that you don't like, the websites that you don't like, invariably, the complaint turns out to be, is too complicated. I can't find what I want. All right, it's confusing to navigate, those sorts of things. So is it possible to be too simple? Yes. But it's more likely that people carry things too far and make it too complicated. All right. So it's kind of like there are people in the world that exercise too much. All right. But that is not what I need to worry about, right? Because it's probably unlikely that I'm ever going to fall into that category. All right. So the error that people tend to make with web design is making it too complicated as opposed to making it too simple. So we're going to talk about, we're going to start out talking about colors with CSS because colors are pretty obvious, uh, again, unless you're colorblind, of course. Is, is anyone colorblind in here? I guess I shouldn't assume that. You are. What, yeah, what sort of colorblindness do you have? Red, green, color blindness. Okay. As we do these examples, if anything doesn't seem clear, please let me know. All right? Please let me know, and, and I'll do what I can to correct it. And in fact, you can, you can help us um, with our usability of this by pointing out things that are difficult for you to, to either see or distinguish between two colors. All right? Thank you. All right. So... We're going to start off and we're going to go over uh, different colors um, for this, how to make colors. And the important thing to recognize here is that we're not just making colors because we like these colors. We are making things different colors because that can add to the meaning. That is, it can emphasize things. All right? And it can... Um, you know, it can help the user organize things in the sections, all right? It's just like highlighting in your book. You make it a different color that highlights something and that stands out. So let me download the example that we had for last time and let's add some style to it. Okay, as I did, as I reminded you before, I am going to unzip the contents of this. All right, I downloaded the zip file. Again, it looks like a, a folder, but it's not really. It's just a single file. So I'm going to extract everything. I'll put it on the desktop. And now, I no longer have a zip folder, but I have an actual folder, so I can see all the files inside of it. Here is my first page. Here is my second page. All right.
going to start off by using style tags within my HTML document. I'm going to do that just because that's a simpler way to do it starting out. Later on, we are going to put our CSS code, our style code, in its own file. Why do you suppose we're going to put our CSS code in its own file? Right, so we can share it among several pages. Again, those of you that are taking software web development classes, you might have me in a bunch of classes, all right? If I ever ask a question and you have no clue what the answer is, just yell out the word maintainability because that's almost always the answer. It's like why we do everything as software developers. Why do we put things in separate files? Makes it easier to maintain. Why do we put comments in our code? Makes it easier to maintain. Why do we break things into classes instead of having one giant program? Easier to maintain. So almost anything that I describe as like being, this is a good way to do it, it's a good practice, relates to, it makes it easier to go back and change. So we're first going to put it in, in, in the HTML document. After we get used to this, because I don't want to bombard you with too much stuff at once, we're going to pull it out and put it in its own file. And then we can have several pages that share the same file. The result will be we can change the way our entire site looks simply by changing one of our CSS files. Anyhow, to start out, I'm going to create a style tag. And again, style tag has a partner, the end style tag. Those two go together. This indicates that I am, the, the style tag indicates that this space from here to here, we are no longer in HTML land. We're in CSS land. So the code that's going to exist between here and here is not HTML code, but is CSS code. All right? So I'm going to start out with something simple. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say body. And we'll, we'll explain what this does in a second here. Well, I'm going to say body background And let's see what this does. All right, I'm going to save it. Then I'm going to go and view it in the browser. All right. Well, let me turn off some lights here so it's easier to see, although this is kind of a bad color choice. All right. What did it do? Well, it made the background of the page gray and it made the text blue. All right. These names of colors, can I use the name of any color? Not really. I can use certain colors are predefined. So let's go up and let's look up. Maybe we can use like a lighter gray and, and that'll, that'll work just as well. So let's go and look at HTML color names. Hundred forty names are supported by all browsers. There's Alice Blue, Azure, Beige, Bisque, Black, Blanched Almond. Uh, whoever made this uh, clearly had like the big box of crayons when they were growing up and not like the eight colors that I had. The big box, yeah. Let's go in and let's make it Alice Blue. I assume for a name for Alice in Wonderland. 
I guess. All right, so now I go and save it. Oh, I wanted to do this. I wanted to do background Alice Blue. Color gray. Let's switch those around. All right, and there we go. And yeah, okay, that's a little more readable. All right. Let's see what this code means. Let's look at this. First of all, CSS code is a series of rules. All right? I would call each one of these a style rule. What defines a style rule? Two things define a style rule. There is, first of all, what is called the selector. The selector is the first part of a, of a style rule. Then we have a series of attribute value pairs. All right. What do you suppose a selector does? Select something. <laughs> what does that mean now? What does it mean to select something? <laughs> Maintainability. <laughs> Points for trying. Points for paying attention, I should say. What does a selector mean? Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, in a nutshell, the selector says what gets this rule? What you're selecting. What you're selecting to get this rule. So in this case, I said body. All right? If I change that to header, then the whole page won't be Alice Blue, just the header is Alice Blue. Yeah. yeah, a little hard to see. That's sort of a trouble uh, of doing these examples is if I make it too vivid, they're like really ugly colors. But if I make it too simple, then it's or too subtle, it's hard to see. Let's try something other than Alice Blue. Let's try Cadet Blue. All right, there we go. That's a little more obvious. At any rate, the selectors can be the selectors define what gets this style rule. Now, we're going to study a bunch of different kinds of selectors, but they all serve the same purpose. They allow us to point to something on the page and say, this gets this rule. Those things that match this criteria get this rule. The simplest kind of selector is this one, an HTML tag. If you define an HTML tag, then every HTML tag that matches that tag will get this rule. So for example, if I were to say li, I don't want to do li. I want to do section. All right. Then what gets this rule? This section and this section. All right. There's two sections on the page. If I say header, then just the header gets it. Now, if I say body, all right, the whole why is that? I just said body, and the whole page gets it. Right, because the body wraps around everything. Everything is in the body section. That is part of the cascading aspect of cascading style sheets. All right? In other words, if something is contained within another tag, 
If you have a style on the outer tag, the tags inside it get it as well. And we notice that with section. Let's go in and let's, let's actually switch around the sections. And let me say that I want everything in a section to be background white <coughs> color cadet blue. Thank you. Check and make sure you guys are paying attention. Good job. And sure enough, that's what we get. The body of the page, the whole page, gets that rule, but the section style rule, being more specific, overrides it. That's part of the cascading of cascading style sheets. All right? If I say header, background of gray, what is a header going to look like? Well, it's going to have a background of gray. What color will the text be? Color will be white. Why is that? Right, because that cascaded down. In other words, everything in the body gets a color of white. Color, again, means the text color. And a background of cadet blue. All right? Now, I've overruled that. I've made a more specific rule for specific parts of my page. Sections have those things reversed. So I have a background of white and a text color of cadet blue. The header, I've overruled the background color part, but I haven't said anything about the text color. Therefore, the text color associated with the body cascades down and gets applied to the header. So if we look at this, this is what we have. All right, and again, white background. I'm sorry, white text, gray background. A little thought in developing these rules helps. Again, because of maintainability. Otherwise, you can make a very sort of convoluted mess with having dozens of style rules when you might be able to simplify things and get by with a couple. All right. Let's look more closely at these attribute value pairs. All right. First of all, they're in these curly brackets or braces, whatever you call them. They consist of a name of an attribute, a colon, and then the value for that attribute. Attribute is what? Characteristic. All right? So characteristic of the body is what color is the text. And again, these things are predefined. I didn't make them up. The color for the text is color. All right? Colon. And then I have, I can select from a list of predefined values for color. And in this case, it's white. All right? Background, again, is an attribute. And colon, the value, is from a list of predefined values. Between each pair of attributes and values, you have a semicolon. Here's where your debugging skills come in and are important. If, for example, I did this, which I did, I think, for a second. How's this going to look? All right. Hmm. What can I tell? Well, that style rule didn't seem to take effect. So I can sort of guess that the problem is somewhere 
with that style rule. This one is pretty obvious. We'll talk more as the, the term goes on about troubleshooting techniques for CSS rules. But one thing that I like to do is if I'm having problems with my style, I'll get rid of all the styles. I'll you know, go and copy them into another file. Then I'll slowly add them back in until I see it break. All right? So in other words, in this case, I have three style rules. If I take them all out, I'll see the plain page. If I start adding them back in, if, okay, that one looks good, that one looks good, ooh, there's a problem with that, I can at least then focus on that one style rule instead of looking at, you know, staring at a page worth of style rules. One thing that's very important, and again, some of you may be taking other software development classes, and I think this still applies there as well. Whenever you're trying, and I guess it applies to even networking issues, you know, as well, or any sort of IT related issues, it's good to have a systematic approach to troubleshooting. All right? I've seen so many people, even experienced developers, well, I'm just going to try something until I find something that works. All right? And that can work, but it's going to be a very inefficient way of doing things. It would be like the difference in an algebra class of guessing the answer and plugging it in and seeing if it works versus actually knowing how to do the algebra and coming up with the solution the way that, that they want you to. By having a systematic way to debug debugging, all right, it helps you find the error a lot quicker and you're not just shooting in the dark. A lot of times what happens is, let's say you have two problems with the style rules in this case, or with a program, or with a networking situation. If you take sort of a haphazard, I'm going to change things and see what works approach, you might fix one of the two problems, it still doesn't work, and think, well, okay, I'm going to undo that change, fix the other problem, and you can really chase yourself around in circles. So it's best to have sort of a good plan in place for troubleshooting. Some of the other things that you can run into. Let's say I forgot that brace. Again, I get something that looks like that. I can see again that the section style rule and the header style rule did not apply. So therefore, there's something that's keeping that section from applying. Even worse would be is if I forgot the end style tag. What do you suppose is going to happen there? Exactly. Thinks the whole page is a style sheet and doesn't display any of the content. Again, as is stated in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, don't panic, all right? You have a problem like this, all right, and nothing shows up, it could be a very, very, very small problem. That, if anything, is sort of the frustrating part of, of, of software development and, and coding, is that if one little thing is wrong, you can get zero results. Let's say you're writing an essay in English class and you don't know how to spell a word, all right? What do you do? Well, you take a guess, and you continue on with your paper. You can still finish your paper, all right? If you had a similar problem in a programming thing, it just doesn't work at all, all right? It just blows up, sits there looking at you, all right? And therefore, it's very precise. You need to find sort of a systematic way to find these problems. Now, we're going to focus on color, again, because that's a very obvious thing and, and it's, it's visible and so on. I do want to point out a couple of things. First of all, whoops. First of all, notice that this text is not white and this text is magenta. Why is that? Because, yeah, well, the magenta one is because it's been clicked. And then why is this one blue? 
It's a link. But we said everything in the section should be, or everything within, everything within the body should have a text color of white. Why isn't that? Well, what it gets down to is this. Remember what I said early on, even before we started doing any CSS, the way your page look depends on two things. Thing number one is the defaults of the browser. Thing number two is what style rules you create. So, in this case, I did not create anything to override the, the, the link's default appearance. Therefore, I get the appearance that the browser wants to give to a link. Now, how can I make a style for a link? A? A colon? Okay. I, I want to do it just for every link. I, I see where you're getting at, right, but, but I don't want to quite go there yet. color and I could make this let's try yellow and now all my links are yellow right. notice even the visited one is all right so I kind of broke that functionality by putting that in there's not always a rhyme or reason to this. In other words, okay, I can see why regular links, but why the visited? Well, that's just the way it works. All right. Now, there's a whole slew of other attributes as far as CSS goes. For example, there's a border attribute. And I'm going to say I want it to be five pixels wide, I want it to be solid, and I want it to be black. And there we go. Five pixels wide, solid, and black. And it's just around the header section. Almost anything that you're going to ask, like, well, how do I do this? It's like, there's an attribute for it. All right? Just like there's an app for it. Right? There's an attribute for it. Yeah, there's an app for that. Right. So, in other words, the question of, for example, how can I make it so that my heading doesn't smash right up against that? Well, it's a matter of two things. Anything you want to do in CSS is a matter of two things. What selector do I want to use? And what attribute do I want to set? Well, it's pretty clear what selector I want to use here. Which selector would I want to use? The header section uh, selector, right. And what do I want to do? Well, that's a little less clear. In our particular case, it is the padding. We'll cover what's called the CSS box model in a lot more detail later on in the course. But for now, let's just say that padding is the distance between the border and where the text starts. Or content starts is probably a better way to put it. Oh, I put that on body. Come on, guys, you weren't paying attention. <laughs> well, you found out, didn't I? <laughs> didn't you? There we go. And there's five pixels. Let's make it a little more dramatic. Because that's barely perceptible. All right. Now, again, you can sort of carry this around, right? Hmm. 
it put 25 pixels this way, but it also put 25 pixels that way and that way. Well, again, these are questions for another day. But suffice it to say, there are attributes that control that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, try, I try to structure my class like, like the TV show Alias used to be, where like at the end of class, every, we, every, every class there's like a cliffhanger to keep you wanting to come back, you know. And what you do to make your page look perfect is, oh, we're out of time, you know. All right. Now. We saw 140 colors, but there's a lot more than 140 colors, right? How do you get the other colors? Well, there is what's called hexadecimal code. And I'll explain it to you, but the good news is, is it's like gravity, all right? What do, what do, what do scientists say about gravity? A lot, yeah. Specifically, what scientists say about gravity is, it doesn't matter if you understand it or not, it still works. All right? So, I'll show you, I'll explain, like, the thought process behind it, and then we'll look at, like, okay, if you didn't catch any of this, all right, just copy and paste. All right? Okay, if you could imagine, I have, if you, or better yet, do you remember those before, uh, again, I, I Probably need to update my references because pretty soon I'm going to say these things and people are going to stare at me, but like, what? But do you remember those old big screen TVs? Okay, the old school ones, not the cool ones they have now. All right. What they did is they had like a screen, kind of like this screen, and they had a projector like that, but the projector had three little mini projectors, little sources of light. And what colors were they? They were RGB. Very good. We know where we're going with this. They're red, green, and blue. All right? Red, green, and blue, is that enough to get every color? Yes. All right? Won't go into the physics of it, but RGB will give you every color. And how did it work? How did it work? By adjusting, and let's imagine we're not showing an actual TV picture, but let's just imagine we have like a spotlight on there. All right. If all of them are off, what color is the screen? Black, assuming we're in a dark room. All right. If all of them are on, what color is the screen? White. If just the red is on, what color is the screen? Red. <laughs> if the red and blue are on, what color is the screen? Purple, thank you. All right. And then every other color is a mix of those. The hex code is sort of like that. There is a, char a set of six characters. The first two represent how high the red's turned up. The second set represent how high the green's turned up. The third set represent how high the blue is turned up. All right. How do we indicate how high it's turned up? We indicate it with what are called <laughs> hexadecimal digits. All right? In our normal decimal number system, you know, it goes from 0 to 9, and then it starts 10, 11, 12, then it goes 20. All right? Hexadecimal is a numbering system like that, except instead of there being 10 digits, there's 16 digits. All right? First, 10 are the same, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Then they start using letters to represent. So A, B, C, D, E, and F. All right? Once you get the F, what's the number following F? 1, 0. All right? So 1, 0. Then 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4. When you get the 1, F, what's the next number after that? 2, 0. All right? And so on. So what in hexadecimal? FF. And what's the lowest number? Zero, zero. All right. What is higher? 9A or D0? D0. How do you know that? Well, just like you'd ask, what's higher, 79 or 37? Well, you look at the highest digit. 
D is bigger than A, so therefore that's bigger. You don't have to look at the second digit unless it happened to be a tie. All right. So. <laughs> That's okay. Again, remember gravity. <laughs> All right. So if we're looking at this, in this stuff, what would this be? This, this represents G. This represents B. Why does this thing keep switching? I'm not touching anything. All right. Well, how much? It's a type of red. We know that immediately, right? Because G and B are turned all the way off. So it's a shade of red. You, you might, you might. How would you describe it qualitatively between this? Which one's brighter? First is a brighter shade. This would be a darker shade. Why? Because the red lamp is turned down a little bit. So yeah, burgundy, crimson, I don't know. Something like that. And this purple. Which one is dark? What else could you say about that shade of purple? <laughs> Still going to be a pretty bright purple. All right. But what about it? It's a shade of purple. Yeah. As opposed to this, which would be a bluer shade of purple. So this would be closer to blue. My shirt is covering my mic. <laughs> All right. Still on. OK. So this will be a bluer shade of purple because there's more blue. The blue is turned up higher. And again, as we fade that down, it would get closer and closer and closer to blue. All right. Someone tell me what a shade of gray would be. Well, what would FFFFFF be? This is white. All of our, and black would be what? All zeros. So, so what would be a shade of gray? Zero, 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 gray. All right, question. How many shades of gray are there? No, there is not. That, in fact, was my beef with that book. You know, I saw that book come out. I'm like, what are they talking about? There are more than 50 shades of gray. How many shades of gray are there? Actually not. Not within HTML. I mean, in the real world there might be, but... With an HTML uh, world, with the, you're, you're on the right track. No? There would be 254 shades of gray. All right? How did I come up with that number? Well, no, I didn't Google it. All the 
from 0, 0 through FF is 256. 16 to the second power. All right? And that is 256. For there to be gray, we have a combination of each of these having to be the same. So any combination where the three numbers are the same is a shade of gray. So A, 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 A is a shade of gray. A, 0, A, 0, A, 0 is a shade of gray, and so on. All right? So there's 256 possibilities for this value and the other two. And we can eliminate two, right? Because 0 is black. is white. So when that movie comes out, I want to see every one of you guys picketing it, saying, this is a lie. There are 254 shades of gray. And then, if you want to get cl Exactly, exactly. Now, what can we say quietly about the difference between these shades of gray? Are they the same? Which one's lighter? Top one, right. Because, again, we're going to compare from the higher digit over, and this one, A, is greater than zero. So there's more of each of the three colors, so it is lighter. Again, if I were to say the difference between these two, Well, these two are the same, so you look at this. This one would be slightly lighter, but I doubt would even be able to tell the difference. All right, probably not even perceptible, the difference between those two. All right, let's go and let's put this into practice. So let's go in and let's make... Pound sign FF, FF, zero, zero. That's red turned all the way up and green turned all the way up. Doesn't look any different. It's actually yellow. It's counterintuitive. Counterintuitive, but red plus green is yellow. Let's go and do this. That'll be purple. All right, purple. And if I make this a lower number, make it a much lower number. It'll be darker and it will be more blue. Darker and more blue. Now, okay, so that's our intro to that. What if you, what if my shirt was blocking my microphone, or you started wondering when the next snow day was, or you were a little confused about hexadecimal math, or any of those things? You can Google it, all right? In other words, H, if you Google HTML color codes, you'll see a plethora of things and you could go in and let's say I like this color blue. Boom. That's a shade. Yeah. Oh. I took a quiz online and it said that it thought I was 64 years old. It's like, man, yeah, really. I must have led a, led a hard life. <laughs> all right, and there we see we have that shade of blue. Now, all right, take a good look at me. It's quite clear that I do not know how to match my clothing. All right, so how do you pick colors that go together? Well, if you have good taste in the matter, you know, you, you just follow your intuition and pick colors that go together. It's amazing. Uh, my sister paints, and she paints watercolors. 
And I don't know if she has a color wheel or what, but I was playing around manipulating some of her images, looking to see what color she used. And she used what scientifically would be almost exactly complementary colors in one of her works. And I don't know if she just knows that, or it just felt right to her, or if she has a color wheel or what. But there's science in colors. All right, there really is. So for those of us that don't have a great intuition or sense of that or whatever to trust, we can look for an HTML color scheme generator. <laughs> and we can pick and this is, this is a good one, and we'll, we'll play around with it a little bit, and this will be the cliffhanger, all right, for next time. But I can pick, let's say, I like that shade, all right? This is what's called monochromatic. It's really hard to see this on the screen. On, on my screen, it's a lot easier to read. This is monochromatic, which means it only uses shades of one color. But what it does is it gives you a choice of several of these that go together. I could also pick complementary colors, which use some opposite, or triads, or tetrads. Exactly. Exactly. And then I can go and I can use these, and without having that sort of sense myself, I can use this tool to pick a scheme. So if you're doing something and you wanted a springish look to it, you could say, well, let's see, green's a nice spring color. Let's find that. Yeah, let's put it there. And yeah, we'll go with that one. All right, and it would be greenish. Or if we were doing fall, we could say, well, nice orange reddish palette might be yeah, maybe that is good for fall all right or whatever again this allows you to pick the colors in such a way that um, even without understanding color theory or having that sort of intuition you can you can systematically pick the ones that you want so we'll talk about this more next time and we will uh, build on the example that we did today. All right, see you up in lab. Next time, yeah.